Welcome to Kicking Kickstarter with me, Jekylls. I am here with Karen Crisis to talk about her Kickstarter music project, Karen Crisis, her first solo album. Tell us a bit about yourself. Well, I was actually in a metal band called Crisis for 13 years. Um, When I moved to New York, I actually moved to New York City in the early 90s to go to art college. And um, I just kind of had the situation there where things were really working out. Um, I got a scholarship to a wonderful college, but um, I already had my visual vocabulary really defined. I was very into comic books at a young age, and um, I really, I was inspired by like Bill St. Kevitz and Kent Williams and Arkham Asylum and a lot of really painterly comics, and I was also into music at the same time and photography, and so my world was pretty developed, and I thought I wanted to go to art school, but when I got there, there were just so many restrictions and limitations um, that it wasn't a really a right fit. So after that first year, um, uh, I you know, lived in New York City and found my way down near the World Trade Center, rented a room there, and got introduced to the guys who had already formed this band called Crisis, and they were from a variety of metal bands and industrial um, metal-type bands from Chicago, and they just happened to be looking for a female singer. And I was really influenced by music like Cocteau Twins and Einstrass and Annoy Bautzen and a lot of British pop and experimental, loosely categorized type of music. Just singing music, you name it. And um, I was actually looking to be in a heavier type of band. I was exploring this nice divide between ethereal vocals and this sort of primal scream. And so all of these things culminated in spring of 1993, right after my father passed. The photographer that I was renting a room from in the apartment in New York City, um, down at the seaport, was having a big party for um, some famous in the underground uh, artists, photographers, musicians, and I was invited to meet all of these people. And on the same day, uh, my father passed right before the party. And I had always had this dream since I was younger that my parents died, and I went wandering into the desert with a guitar and found a band of musicians who took me in. And that's literally what happened. Because a day before this party happened, where I met all these other people in this community, I had auditioned for this band Crisis. And I had never sung in a experimental metal band. And this was not a standard hair metal band. We were, there were a lot of musical influences from different countries, and it was very emotional and a lot of people that used to say about my band Crisis that even though they didn't like metal they liked our band because there was just so much emotion going on there. So the day before I had auditioned for this band and um, I was actually looking forward to letting my dad hear this band because I didn't really know him growing up. And all of that changed but here I was uh, at this big party having just joined this band um, and I had let my primal scream out during the audition. Normally a very introverted artist type person. At this audition the day before, um, I just heard this type of singing in my head, which goes from very feminine to very masculine. And I thought, well, I'm gonna try to pull this off. And I got invited into this audition with these girly looking men. And I just asked them to play this particular song that I had you know, heard the, the vocals and the lyrics for the night before. And literally when they started playing, it was like someone plugged me into a light socket and I was kind of jumping all around the room. All the words fit into place perfectly. It was meant to be. And um, 13 years later, after touring countries, touring America quite a lot, and being a band that made a big name for ourselves, I find myself here. But that all started with this weird synchronicity about some big events in my life, some changes, some dreams that I had and um, kind of getting out of my shell and opening to the music world in a different way. And it was very exciting for me and it can be very challenging in those early years there on the East Coast. I have to say that I feel really privileged to have kind of grown up in that musical environment, so to speak, because there was a lot of interesting hardcore, there was a lot of interesting metal, there was alternative rock, and everything was pretty divided in those days. And over time, everything started melding and molding and cycling together. But I was literally the only woman at some of these shows, you know, and um, in the early days, in the early 90s, you had to go on stage and prove yourself. You know, no one was really, they were like, yeah, we've seen it all before, so show us what you got. And it was really, I liked that idea of the challenge. I was like, I'm just going to rip my heart open and, you know, here it is for you, like it or not. And 
um, we won people over. In fact, um, we didn't stay in New York City as a band. We, it was really hard to get shows in New York City at that time. New York was kind of like, well, we don't know who you are. So we literally had to go out and around, and so we became naturally a touring band from the beginning. And over time, we saw the dynamic change of metal, not only with a lot more emotion coming into the music, but a lot more women, people of color, and it was this wonderful melting pot, and, um, which we were as a band anyway. And so 13 years later, after doing a lot of touring, I just decided that I wanted to um, enjoy some of the simple things in life. Touring is really sacrificial. And I had some spiritual quests of my own that I wanted to go on to try to understand what some of these things were that I'd been through since I was a child. It drew me to things like comic books and music and art in any way, which were like ghost stories and premonitions and synchronicities and um, things like this. So I was starting to ask a lot of these questions uh, at the very end of 2005, and I just, again, all these synchronicities came into place, and I got the opportunity to leave that life and go on a vision quest, if you will, and trust it and let it take me where I needed to go, which was a whole nother adventure for me, and that took a handful of years, and that culminated in me being brought back into music. I guess, you know, I'm not done with music, so what ended up happening, another long story short, is I ended up on this magical quest in Tuscany, Italy, where I met my husband, and we now are just now, after a couple of years of working on music together, bringing this album project out into the world with some other phenomenal musicians. And that's what spurred sort of the Kickstarter. But it's been a really wild ride. And um, music seems to be this continuity for me ever since I was a child, as well as art. <laughs> and which parts of your life do you draw from for inspiration when you write your lyrics and your music? In the past, a lot of it had to do with my own challenges um, of feeling really limited in a physical body, whether it's because I'm a very petite woman, I had health issues like asthma for sitting there, you know, on tour, it can be really challenging if you catch a cold, um, you know, to deal with the limitations of the physical body, and I just, um, I just talked about a lot of those ideas of you know, the, the feeling of my energy and things that I wanted to do is the he, superhuman inside me being trapped and limited by the physical body. So those were a lot of the ideas in the earlier band. Um, and the music, the energy of that music was very explosive and expansive, so it sort of busted through all those limitations anyway. And it tended to be read musically by people as cathartic and empowering. But all of the lyrics for this album for Gospel of the Witches, this current project, have to do with like the great mystery and ancient ways and traditional um, ideas like the witch and the healer and all of these things that have to do with everything that's going on as underneath our physical surface as a human being. So the great mysteries and the seeking path and trying to understand the universe from a magical perspective. And it's very interesting because um, as, it just, as dark and mysterious and creative as this album is, it's almost like a testament uh, to love in a way because it was written musically by my husband for me as he was helping encourage me um, explore these things and go on this path and um, learn what I wanted to learn in this way. So this has sort of culminated in this very epic album um, that I've really been enjoying taking a hands-on approach to the creativity aspect as well, whether it's the photo shoots or these mini videos we've been doing for the songs. Um, and it was all about the idea for this album project to make it something really enjoyable. It's not that I didn't want to work with the label, but the process of trying to get an album as close enough to the finish point before actually going into studio can be very costly and, and laborious, and then trying to convince the record label, you know, can count on you. I always had a strong connection with the fans, but my voice was so strange that it was kind of a hard sell to music, and I can totally understand that. So I thought from this time, you know, I'm really ready to make this album this just feels like a wonderful creative project that will bring a lot of people in on. And I really want to, no matter where it goes, um, how far or um, how short of a road this album goes, I wanted to really leave an imprint out there of just really empowering creativity. So every step along the way, I wanted to really enjoy it and celebrate it and not feel limitations and not feel like I was asking for permission to just really be free to let that creative world inside out. And so that's what kind of began this whole Kickstarter project 
because I thought, well, I'll just start doing everything on my own. And I'll reach out heart to heart to the fans who've been staying in touch with me anyway. And if they want to, or if they're getting into studio to get the actual album made in studio, um, you know, then we can do that together. And then if there's a life for this project afterwards, um, hopefully the energy that we sent out doing this will, you know, make things grow from here. But I thought it was a wonderful way of intentionally saying every moment I spend on this is going to be precious and really fun and celebratory and creative. And tell us a bit about the album itself, like the story behind it, because the video for your Kickstarter project, quite a mirror image of how you come across now, are quite different to the actual video that you created for the project. So tell us a bit about the video. The video meaning the little 12-minute film? Yes. So the, the 12 minute film is one of three videos that are up on the Kickstarter. The two shorter videos are um, like song preview videos. So they're unfinished songs, but um, to just further illustrate the atmosphere there, I you know made some picturesque videos. And the 12 minute film definitely counts, um, or is a recounting or an admission of what I've been doing since I left my first band, which is exploring the world of mediumship. And I think that's what you're alluding to. Um, and so ever since I was a child, and this really came about when I was in the band for 13 years as well, I used to see, you know, ghosts um, in the room with me. I felt people were, as a child, you know, watching me as I slept in my bed, and I didn't know how to interpret a lot of these experiences. When you can see a ghost in the room very clearly, make out the mustache and the kind of clothing, you feel a little bit more reassured that, well, there's someone there. I don't know exactly who that is or how they're there but I can tell that's a person. When you're just feeling the emotions or the sensation of someone watching you, that can be very worrisome. And I had that kind of thing following me through my life through, you know, adolescence to adult time. And at the same time, I was having a lot of psychic experiences. And so a, lot, a, a lot of us have, like, dreams, premonitions. Um, I'd be able to understand who someone was despite their words or their appearance or the way they presented themselves intentionally. I could always see beneath the surface. And it was almost like I was privy to this city court world, and I was trying to tell other people about it, but a lot of people around me were afraid of it or didn't understand it. I didn't even know what to talk about or what to, how to describe these things as a younger person. In fact, I was humorous side of it when I went on my first date when I was about to move to New York City this man took me out to um, a bar that looked like something out of a David Lynch movie you know there was a jazz band playing and there were low hanging ceilings with glitter and there was a white marble countertop and I kept saying excuse me or oh pardon me or hello to people that were bumping into me and um, you know by the end of the night he drove me home and he just looked over at me and said I just have to ask you know are you on drugs and I said why because I was, I was very much a nerd and he said, well, you've been talking to people all night long who aren't there. Hmm. And I realized, okay, you know, something is going on here for, um, for me that isn't necessarily going on for other people. <laughs> and I can laugh at that now, but at the time I was mortified. But when I left my first band and moved to Northern California, I literally said, universe, what is all of this about? And, and uh, um, in order to heal some of my own wounds, I explored different healing modalities like Reiki, like shamanism, um, European shamanism, early witchcraft from uh, uh, Tuscany, Italy, and I was trying to understand um, what are the secrets to everything that's going on beneath our physical world, and playing with a lot of these tools and learning a lot of these modalities helped me understand <coughs> that a lot of the things I was experiencing was very natural, but I just didn't know necessarily know how to call them or how to categorize it, so it seemed very overwhelming. So the, the, and then I began training as a spiritualist being, which is a specific tradition um, and in the U.S. and, and actually in England in the early 1800s about how to categorize these experiences, how to you know set a high vibrational state, or in other words, keep quality company with physical, you know, people in physical bodies as well as people in the spirit world. So there wasn't just a mass amount of chaos around me. And so the, the movie at the beginning of my Kickstarter talks largely about that side of my life being what has propelled me to create this new album and all the emotions and the poetic lyrics about these kind of experiences there. And um, part of this album, you know, it's being called, it's called Gospel of the Witches. And it's an honor to everything that I, I, I 
strange and weird like that I've had a few odd ones myself but tell us about the musical influences that you have what did you um, grow up listening to and what kind of bands have you drawn from to create this album well before I joined Crisis in 1993 I was listening to a lot of wax tracks uh, industrial bands on the Chicago label like Ministry and Revolting Cox and I was really into um, like Cranes and uh, Cocktail Lens was a huge influence on me and Sugar Cutes in the early days and I liked a lot of and New Order and Bauhaus and Cure and I loved a lot of these bands and had a lot of atmosphere. Um, that atmosphere really drew me in especially because it was darker and poetic and I always found that um, a very interesting and romantic place to be. I felt like um, I really felt drawn to this idea of the phoenix bird, and I felt like, you know, going into my own darkness and facing me without any crutches, without any help, I'd be able to find whatever I needed to learn out of it. And for me, that music was all about that atmosphere and going into the dark and finding the light, and it was very poetic. And at the same time, um, you know, I didn't really have a vocabulary in metal so much at that time, but I liked some some harder rock, and Neubau, Einstein and Neubau was also a huge influence on me. And I had already begun playing guitar and bass, then I had a Korg Poly uh, 6 synthesizer, and was really focusing on going from atmospheres of, you know, ethereal peace and exploring these angelic kind of voices into this really guttural screaming. And when I joined uh, my band in 1993, um, all the guys in that band were listening to all sorts of metal, like Sepultura, like Slayer, um, like sound, like hard rock, like Soundgarden, and um, a lot of underground bands too. And uh, I really uh, was excited about this music. I really felt drawn to the energy of it. I really loved the intense drumming. Um, I really liked the sort of guttural type of screaming that men were doing. And uh, it was interesting because I was experimenting with that on my own before I had heard it. And um, you know, so I kind of dove into that world. I was following my own voice intuitively, but I was learning a lot more about these bands. Um, but at the same time, I loved the metal world. I almost didn't feel such a part of it because I was so much from this world of like Susie and the Banshees and Cocteau Twins. Like, that felt um, very natural to me. I understood it. And as much as um, you know, I felt set alight by metal, um, I, I can't say that I'm someone who's well-versed in listening to a whole lot of stuff, I really dove into the underground side of things, so bands that we were playing with, bands we were on tour with, and I really love the uh, the masculine energy of a lot of that music as well, whether it was hardcore and really putting this high energy out there, or it was metal, like, sort of diving into the darkness and, you know, taking it by the balls and becoming the hero of the story at the end, um, I really loved those energies, and I liked being in a band I guess I felt a little more gender neutral at that time. I was just me. I wasn't really thinking, oh, I'm a woman in a metal band, but I really like to come up against the, uh, that male energy in our songwriting. I kind of felt like they go to the mountain and I was the climber. And I would say now with the new album, um, things are definitely different. Things are, some of the things are the really incredible atmospheres there that are very emotional. And I would almost say that they have some, nod some reference to some of my influences in the past, even though those weren't Davide's influences when he wrote those um, musical pieces, but I would say that they definitely invoke some of that mystery of those um, bands in the 70s and the 80s with these smoky atmospheres and this idea of being in some, you know, church with its roof blown off after the apocalypse that stands on top of other ancient temples after ancient temple, and there's this resonance of these dark stormy clouds, flow, you know, flowing through. Vocally, I definitely um, am taking this idea of 70s 
feminine, femininity, and masculinity to, to a new level. In, in crisis in the past, I used to kind of go back and forth between people would like to say between sounding like an angel and a demon and melodic uh, vocals as a woman and going into the guttural or the high screams more like a guy. And, and um, in this album, I'm definitely using a lot of those same textures with my voice. Um, but there are times where I go more into the feminine nature of my voice and go into purely melodies. And Ross Dolan from Immolation, who's a phenomenal East Coast metal band who's been around for many, many years, um, I've asked him to back me up on almost all the songs he'll be singing. Um, his, his really low masculine growl on the choruses so that they're very thick and serpentine and almost like, um, you know, these, these mantras that are sort of innocent. So the whole idea of the song um, is to choose words carefully, or the album is to choose words carefully um, about these great mysteries, to choose atmospheres carefully, to choose the layers of voice carefully, so that um, you know some things tend to repeat a little bit and almost act like a modern day mantra, you know, where you kind of get drawn into this sort of beat and you let it take you into the spiral within and kind of see what you may find on your journey if you choose to take that journey. So. Uh, emotionally, the song is much. The songs are much more epic, and they go into a lot of places that um, my band didn't in the past, and um, a little bit difficult to describe, you know, because of that emotional uh, quality there. And then the vocals definitely are anchored in these thick, heavy choruses that are again like these repetitive, um, heavy, heavy mantras. And then they break out into this beauty of these feminine uh, melodies again later on. And how do you go about writing the lyrics? Or your songs? Lyrics for me are uh, 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 something that happened when I'm not focusing on the I find that uh, ever since my early days of making music, if I'm really focusing on writing a song that I'm trying way too hard, and I'm going to convolute things and they're not going to come out naturally. I literally maybe trace the history of the word through that thesaurus, an old thesaurus, and you can do that. But now I pretty much uh, think of a concept or maybe a word that has caught my attention for the day. And when I'm walking or I'm on the train, I really, it's almost like channeling. I really let the lyrics come through me. Um, and I feel like they, they're, the, the words that come out are meant to come out that way. Again, I feel like if anything I'm doing creative, I'm trying really too hard to make that happen. I feel like um, the expression is not so successful. And it's a lot of what I talk about in that 12-minute video about being open to spirit, um, letting spirit work through me in the morning, in, um, in the moment, letting my guides channel an idea through me. So I just really remain open in that connection and um, almost kind of like in a really light meditative state, let the words come out. But I definitely, um, before I do that, I have a focused intention on an atmosphere that I would like to come out. You know, I'm not really a musician anymore, and I don't consider myself so much a writer. So I find that the work that's really important for me is to create in my imagination first, kind of get a sensation, a feeling, almost like an image, you know, from a movie. And from that place, I feel like the appropriate words stream their way out when they're ready. So how come you came to Kickstarter, and if, when you reach your goal, what will you use the funds for? I came to Kickstarter, um, I looked at some of the other ways of crowdfunding, and I knew that Kickstarter from our search was a very uh, reputable um, name for a company that does, does crowdfunding, so I figured that would be a really good way to start. Of course, there is the challenge um, of meeting your goal. If you don't meet your goal, you don't get those funds. Um, so, you know, we'll see what happens if we come to that point, but I thought it was just a really um, clean, trustworthy, really well done platform for getting out this idea of here's some of these videos I've created, here's a film about what this album is about. I felt like it was a great way to create, put a lot of media together, a lot of creativity to sort of express an idea of an album that is not finished yet. So trying to tell people what I want to do for this album without being able to lay it out there, I felt like it was a great platform to do that. Um, and all of the expenses are broken down pretty simply, a, a good chunk of the money or most of it goes to the studio that we have already scheduled and booked and a down payment on for June 2nd through June 24th. Really honored to be working with Jamie King uh, of the basement from Cobar in New York. And he worked with like between the Barry and me and a lot of phenomenal bands. And I figured he would be the right position to deal with all these different layers of things. So studio is booked and ready to go and a large amount of money goes to that and the other musicians. We all know in modern days, a lot of bands don't live in the same cities anymore. So, for example, Ross is doing his vocals. He lives in upstate 
like in New York. So he'll be going to the studio where his band Emily goes to record. So there's very those expenses to take care of. And Danny Walker on drums will be recording his drums um, in Long Beach at the studio that he works there quite often with his band Intronaut. So there's like a whole nother because they're paying for different studios. And um, then Davide and I will be tracking guitars and bass and vocals in North Carolina. And that takes care of most of that. But then there's of course getting some of the rewards and the, and the shipping done and some of the extra things like marketing that have gone into it. But the large variety, the, the majority of the money goes to the actual recording of that album and the mastering and the mixing. And Jane is doing that too. So at the end of January, January 24th, I'll actually have all formats of the album, which is lovely. I won't have to send it out to a separate person for mastering and mixing and it will be really ready to be put into production. And I am also taking care of the CD and the vinyl production, which was where the money goes to as well. Without a label, you know, it's all that we need to make this happen. And how do you hope to go about distributing it once it's created and where can people go to find out more about your solo project, your work and yourself? Well, to start with, um, since this is an album, you know, between me and the fans, the, my main concern is actually getting the studio, getting everything done, and getting people what the rewards and things that they ordered. So the formats, the vinyl, the CDs, the digital, the t-shirts, etc. From there, um, and hopefully, um, you know, I've begun starting some conversations with other people. I would love to have this be a project that continues. I mean, I'll be continuing it anyway, but nice to lock them into working with a label and even in the future a booking agent and growing this back into being a busy band again. Um, but one step at a time, uh, you know, the, the most important thing is to get this album made and, um, you know, with fan support, create value from that point. So that's where I'm focused right now, although I do, well, um, so I do have two Facebook pages that, uh, that are consistent, they're not going to end, and once the Kickstarter page ends. And that's Facebook, um, Karen Crisis Official, that's K-A-R-Y-N-C-R-I-S-I-S, and the word official. And the other Facebook page specifically for the band is Gospel of the Witches. And both of those pages have all the updates and my contact information. And if you just want to see all the, the films and the rewards and all the updates of press, etc., on the Kickstarter page, you can simply just go to kickstarter.com, and they have a lovely tab up at the top where you can search and you can type in Karen, K-A-R-Y-N, Crisis, and it will take you right to my page where there are all of the, the main 12-minute video we spoke about at the top of that main page, and they have a wonderful updates tab where you can see the song video previews, you can see Ross Dolan talking about his vocals in the album and what he thinks about the album, and there are a lot of the links that we're getting into that as well there. And what different tiers and rewards can people get when they back your project? The rewards start at like eight dollars, or actually five dollars to get a mini print thank you. Eight dollars to get a digital copy of the album with a mini print. Um, then it goes up from there, like twenty dollars for a CD and um, a print of a hand drawn portrait and a handmade envelope. And they go up into like the hundred dollar range where you can get like a handmade lyric book. Um, in moss and bark or leather cover with um, you know, handmade paper on the inside with all the lyrics written. There's also a deck of cards, almost like a tarot deck, that has um, photos of me from the various films that we've made on one side and all the handwritten lyrics on another side. There are opportunities to do a collaborative painting with me. Um, there are um, options um, to get like vinyl and t-shirt together. And so they start low and they go up um, you know, in a variety of increments based on how many things that you want to get, but they do all have a really nice handmade touch somewhere in there, um, which I've found that a lot of people respond to based on the artwork that I do, and then, um, you know, I've already found a wonderful place to make the CDs and the vinyl um, that a lot of bands and labels that I know work through, so I know that will be done really well and really nice, high quality. So, yeah, um, I thought it would be also interesting to make a lot of the words um, sort of precious in that way, that there's a handmade element along with the actual themes for the vinyl or the digital copy. Thank you very much, Karen Crisis, for talking to us about your Kickstarter project, Karen Crisis, your solo album. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much, Jekyll. I really appreciate it.